Hello and welcome to the Friday, July 27th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, and imagine that we got a new variation of Spectre, actually a new way to exploit Spectre. This particular exploitation technique can happen over the network and does not require that the attacker has actual access, meaning being able to execute code on the target system. It just needs some kind of network daemon that will respond to packets. And this, again, could be sort of any packet. What this really relies on is just like the local Spectre attacks on speculative execution, where the execution time depends on what happened before on the system and essentially leaks data from the cache. Now, in this case, of course, the execution time isn't as easy to measure because you have a lot of other things that happen with network packets, like, for example, inconsistent network latency. But overall, this paper proved it can be done. The problem is the speed isn't really all that impressive. You need hundreds of thousands of bytes to actually extract one byte of cache. What they measured in sort of more or less real world scenarios, meaning on a local network, as well as in Google's cloud is about 15 bits per hour. In another variation of the attack, they got this up to 60 bits an hour. And this is the rate that you achieve if you actually sort of saturate the network. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of data, but still it's possible, uh, but very noisy. The authors of the paper from Cross University also point out that, uh, for example, DDoS protections uh, could be used to protect yourself from this attack. So yes, it's probably yet another reason to worry and to patch Spectre, but other than that, I wouldn't really worry too much about this particular exploit vector. One possible use of the attack that the authors propose is to use it to break address space layout randomization. Now, of course, this would make some other vulnerabilities then easier to exploit. And the Google Play Store is now joining Apple's store in no longer allowing any crypto coin mining applications. Of course, the Google Play Store, just like Apple's App Store, are focusing on mobile devices. Mobile devices typically make pretty bad crypto coin miners and also tend to suffer physical damage if you are running high CPU load applications on them for too long, which sort of basically makes them not usable for any legitimate crypto coin mining. Google has also implemented similar policies for Chrome extensions. Initially, they did actually allow Chrome extensions that did mine crypto coins if they specifically declared this to the user, but I guess that didn't work too well. So back in April, I think it was, they totally outlawed Chrome extensions that mine crypto coins. You will still be able to use, for example, wallets for crypto coins on mobile devices. You will just not be able to mine crypto coins. And according to Microsoft, a software supporting Japanese calendars is running into an interesting problem starting May 1st, 2019. It's sort of reminiscent of the Y2K problem. Japanese calendars count the years as the number of the reign of a particular emperor. Well, ever since we had computers, there was only one emperor in power. However, Emperor Heisei announced that he will resign April 30th, 2019. So starting May 1st, 2019, we will have a new era and with this a new emperor whose reign will then be used to count the years. Of course, a lot of software was coded before this announcement was made. And as a result, they had no idea that there will be this transition coming up. So this software needs to be patched, needs to be updated. And probably a lot of software also just has the name Heisei hard-coded into their calendar system. And Cisco's Talus research team released an advisory detailing 20 different vulnerabilities in Samsung's 
smart things up. This home automation device can be completely exploited using a combination of these vulnerabilities. There are a number of uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities, for example, SQL injection vulnerabilities. They sort of try to hit pretty much all the top 10 here. Now, typically you should, of course, not have this particular device exposed to the open internet. But since a number of these vulnerabilities are, for example, in the Smart Hub REST interface, they could certainly be exploited using various browser attacks. Well, it's Friday again, and with me today I have another STI student, Rhino Crady. We actually were able to record this here at Sans Fire. So, Ryan, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? As you said, my name is Ryan O'Grady. I work with uh, SOAR Technology out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I'm a research scientist in the Cyberspace Operations Division. And our company is primarily focused on uh, artificial intelligence applications, especially cognitive modeling applications. Now, for your research paper, and by the way, the research paper, you'll find the link uh, in the show notes on the sans.edu website. The, the research paper covered a real current topic, and you know, that's Twitter identifying Twitter bots uh, using some machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches to do that. Can you sort of in a sentence or two very quickly sort of summarize your paper and what you learned there? It, the paper is an attempt to look at how much does the recency of training data affect the quality of the uh, predictions made by by classifiers. So really, Twitter is a fairly new system. Like it's five years older. So I don't know. Uh, it's uh, actually about uh, ten years. At this ten point. years. It is okay. Yeah. yeah. Time flies, as <laughs> they say. But um, it's it's kind of obvious, or that uh, bots change over time in Twitter, and we have seen this you now with lots of other bots too. Any specific trends or so that you figured out where some of the old data really didn't describe current bots well? Well, actually, it's interesting. My, my original research uh, topic was going to be using machine learning to identify command and control channels on Twitter, mm -hmm. which is a, a very much an emerging trend. What I found was that, first of all, there isn't good labeled training data out there. And the data I was able to find is actually quite old. So I started thinking about, okay, if I were to use this data, what implications does that have on, on what I can actually predict with current trends? So really, you first have to identify a set of command control channels. Right. And then there's, of course, always the chance that there's a bias involved here because you're basically limited by what bots are known to communicate. So you're less likely going to find bots that are new and that aren't really known yet. Right? That's right. And we're starting to see uh, definitely an improvement in the identification of these, these bot botnets on Twitter. Uh, there was recently a... 500,000 plus botnet identified and written up. Uh, I think it was called the Star Wars bot because they use Star Wars quotes to hide their command and control on Twitter. Um, so as we start actually getting these better training data sets and we can start actually using them for applications, we still have to be cognizant of, are they timely for what I'm trying to detect? With all these machine learning algorithms and such, one thing I always think is often overlooked there is how do you actually protect your data. How do you make sure that the data that you selected is actually data being used for training? Like a malicious actor, for example, could manipulate the data. Was this of concern for you? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually a, you know a level of, of cat and mouse beyond even where where I'm thinking right now. If you know if malicious actors are attempting to put data out there to essentially corrupt the underlying machine learning data, uh, I think that's a, a whole other level of, of issue. Yeah, but you, you just have to protect it. Once you collected it from Twitter, it, you have to protect that data set and make sure that its integrity is preserved. It, it, it yeah. is kept good. And it, you know, it's very much uh, a, a manual process still. You go out and identify these trends, you collect a lot of data, and then a, a human has to sift through them and pull out the, you know, the outliers, the bad data, mm. and things like that. So once you have that training set, I'm, I'm sure a lot of private companies are interested in, in holding it close to the, to the vest. Um, but, you know, hopefully research institutions are able to share that with the research community at large. Now, there are some public training sets I know about, like for facial recognition and such. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like this for Twitter or do you have to come up with your own training set there? For the, there is, um, there's more data out there for what I would call spam bots. Around um, two or three years ago, there was the uh, Arab Spring uprising, and there was a lot of uh, use of Twitter bots on there to try and influence sentiment amongst populations. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a lot more work done and data available for sentiment analysis than there is for uh, what I would call, you know, command and control bots or, or malware bots. Right, your bots are not these political bots, really, that sort of try to launch influence operations. That's, right. of course, a, a huge topic these uh, days. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but a lot of the research has focused on that area, and I yeah. think not a lot has been done uh, in the, the command and control, you know, uh, malware doing. Now, did you find an overlap there, like accounts that were used for command control and were also used for other malicious sort of influence operations or other malicious I actually, purposes? I didn't look at that myself. I, you know, I can only imagine that once these, uh, you know, these bot masters have control of 500,000 accounts, that they're inclined to use them for whatever someone's willing to pay them for. Right, what we see with other bots is that there are these botnets that you can rent essentially yeah, for different exactly. purposes. So they may send spam one day and send malware the other day, right. kind of. Yeah. Well, and these, you know, these large Twitter uh, botnets uh, are doing the same thing where they attempt to spend long enough undetected on Twitter that their account essentially gains credibility. And then they can, you know, rent those accounts out for other, you know, uh, malicious purposes. I don't quite remember. I think that Star Wars bot in particular did something like this. Or where they mm -hmm. initially just sent some innocent tweets, more or less, just to get some credibility, get some history with the exactly. account before they actually started a malicious. And they actually did a activity. really good job. Uh, the researchers did a really good job of uh, analyzing the characteristics of that particular bot because they were doing very predictable things like. Each account would only tw uh, tweet out, you know, ten to thirty messages, and then go silent. And they were all star quotes from Star Wars books. Uh, so it was a very, you know, easy to detect trend once they realized what it was. Uh, as these um, as these bot masters, you know, become more sophisticated, and you know, it becomes a cat and mouse game where they're going to start pushing the envelope of making it harder and harder to detect them. Now. The applicability of your research, would it be more Twitter using this to identify bots or is there something me as an enterprise trying to detect if I am infected by a bot that uses Twitter as command control? Uh, who would use that? So I do discuss this briefly in my, in my paper. Ultimately, I think it's going to be used by Twitter uh, to detect you know, malicious trends within their, their domain. Um, but I can also see how you know individual networks might deploy this at their boundary to look for suspicious uh, command and control traffic being sent to Twitter. And both of those use cases have have drawbacks. Yeah. If you if you're relying on individual network owners to implement some sort of you know control at their boundary, then you have a buy-in problem. You need you know thousands and thousands of network owners to actually buy into this and implement the solution. If you want Twitter to do it, they have a much more of a business incentive, um, but it is going to affect their bottom line. So, you know, getting them to do that also has some inertia against it. And we have seen this recently with Twitter suspending accounts that right. then actually caused Twitter's stock price to drop as a result. Exactly. Uh, now, I would think as an enterprise, I would have some interest just to deploy it myself to check if any systems in my network mm -hmm. are using Twitter as a command control channel to detect bots in my network. Exactly. I think um, you know network owners who are, are trying to do their best or trying to employ best practices uh, would look at this kind of uh, approach to detecting malicious traffic once they've implemented all the you know lower hanging fruit, making sure right. that you know uh, other things aren't leaking out first. Now, have you looked at all into how applicable it is to other social networks? I think a few months back there was like this big incident with Instagram, I think it was, where uh, some famous actor, singer's account was used sort of as a oh. command control channel. But if you've seen this. I actually uh, wasn't, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, it, it was pretty nice or interesting, I should yeah. say, in that it was comments made for a particular, to a particular account oh. that were used so as command like, control channel. So it was like channel. spear phishing for, uh, for uh, social media. No, it was just used as a command control channel for a botnet. Okay. So, uh, were they, were they uh, customizing the messages that they were using through that account to look like they belonged to that account? Correct. It looked like fans of the stars okay. that were making comments. Got it. All right. So that's what it looked like. And it actually looked somewhat plausible and like, you know, millennial, lots of abbreviations right. and emojis <laughs> and such. But once you ran it through a regular expression, you ended up with... Uh, URL shortened URL, but then uh, told a botnet what to go, what to do next. Yeah. The problem is only uh, going to get worse. I mean, they're getting more and more sophisticated. Um, my my research actually started based on a paper uh, uh, by um, Pantic and Hussein. I want to say I, I might have that wrong. Um, called covert command and control over Twitter, 
and they laid out you know a fairly uh, simple method for using length encoding of messages to hide you know traffic mm -hmm. uh, for command and control. And uh, you know as you can see, they're they're getting more and more sophisticated. You know, encoding it in the content itself. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not even encrypted, it's really encoded, but as long as you don't know what right. they... It's steganography, yep. that's really what it is. Anything you're working on right now? Are you continuing this work, or what's next for you? Um, so I, I did this uh, for the master's program. I, I am hoping to continue this work. Uh, this is an area that interests me, and I'm as a research scientist uh, in my company, I get to create my own portfolio, uh, essentially. So this is an area I hope to continue to delve into. Um, but right now I'm doing some pretty interesting work for the DoD on behavior modeling and in particular can we create um, uh, autonomous agents to act as network defenders mm -hmm. to help essentially you know overloaded network defenders by offloading some of the more uh, automatable portions to an agent and then teaming them together so that they work together to defend the network. Sounds great. So thanks for having you and uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Talk to you again on Monday. Bye.